scything through the landscape of northern Britain is Hadrian's Wall, our most famous Roman monument. It was built nearly 2,000 years ago as a dividing line, separating Roman lands in the south from the barbarians to the north. At the heart of the wall's story is a band of forgotten warriors. They are the Roman cavalry. For over a century, historians and archaeologists have been unearthing clues about the Roman cavalry, helping to build a picture of their forgotten world. And now, Digging for Britain is going to join this search at archaeological digs. They're marrying with the people who, generations ago, they actually conquered. At overlooked Roman sites. So these are serious military bases holding hundreds of people and in museums and archives. Starting to really build up this lovely yeah. picture of who these people are. This year, an international team of archaeologists, historians and reenactors have come together using the latest evidence to restore the cavalry to their rightful place in the story of the Roman Empire. As part of this collaboration, a team of modern riders has been recruited for a unique historical display which will celebrate the power and splendour of the Roman cavalry. This is one of the most challenging things that I've done. This project, combined with new research, will allow us to examine how those elusive warriors lived and reveal their crucial role in conquering and controlling Roman Britain. Each new piece of information comes together to help us tell the forgotten story of Rome's secret weapon, its cavalry. When we think of the Romans in Britain, we tend to focus on the foot soldiers, the legionaries. But in fact, the Roman cavalry was central to their military strategy and success. But these elite warriors have vanished from the public imagination. Even in the Roman era, it was the foot soldiers, the legionaries, who hogged the limelight. But the Roman cavalry were at the heart of some of Rome's greatest victories, and they were key to running and defending that vast empire. The cavalry were far fewer in number than the infantry, but vital in conquering and controlling Rome's sprawling empire. But everything we know about them has to be pieced together from small clues found in ancient literature or unearthed at archaeological digs. In 2017, 10 museums along Hadrian's Wall brought, for the first time, all of these fragments of evidence together to create a major exhibition celebrating the legacy of these ancient warrior horsemen. The climax of this project, a live cavalry reenactment involving 30 modern riders. They're attempting to stage a Roman cavalry tournament, a test of skill and bravery, which no one has seen for over 1,600 years. They're drawing on history, on painstakingly translated ancient documents, as well as the latest archaeological revelations in order to bring to life one of the most dazzling spectacles of the Roman world. And it's providing the academics with a unique opportunity to discover something new. By putting their theories into practice, they hope to find out how the cavalry rode, how their kit was worn and actually worked, and what battle tactics they might have brought with them to Britain. This experiment archaeology takes us out of the realm of guesswork and moves us into an area where we can start to make some reasonable estimates as to what's possible. It doesn't give us the answer, but it's every bit as valid as field work. As the team prepares for the big show, I'm going to seek out evidence the cavalry left behind to help build a picture of their role in Roman Britain. My journey begins in Northumberland, on Hadrian's Wall itself.
When the Emperor Hadrian came to power in 117 AD, he launched a vast building scheme to consolidate the sprawling frontiers of the empire he'd inherited. He built a new line of defenses, snaking across 3,000 miles of his frontier, from North Africa to the Black Sea and on through Central Europe to Britain. In Northern England, Hadrian's project was realized as an impassable wall 15 feet high, stretching 75 miles from coast to coast. It was designed to keep out the wild British tribes who lived to the north. On a day like this, you can imagine being a Roman soldier and being pretty disgruntled at having been stationed here on Hadrian's Wall, on the very northern boundary of this wonderful empire, looking out at the land of the barbarians over there. But I think what's really interesting to me today is finding out how our ideas of the wall have evolved over time, and that's all about new archaeological discoveries. I want to find out why Hadrian's Wall became the centre of operations for the Roman cavalry. To get some answers, I'm meeting one of the leading experts on how Hadrian's Wall worked, Matt Simmons. Matt has minutely researched the 80 small forts dotted along the wall, which we now know as mile castles. This is a building attached to the wall then, Matt. What is it? It is. It's a building known as a mile castle, and this particular one is Mile Castle 37. So if this is a mile castle, does that mean there were actually small forts like this every mile along Hadrian's Wall? Essentially, yes, there is a small amount of leeway allowed, but it is an incredibly regimented and ordered system. And it is a radical departure from what the Roman army was doing before. These mile castles saw the Roman army rip up its traditional approach to defence, which had been based on temporary wooden forts. Here in Northern England, they built a continuous line of permanent stone forts, all linked by this defensive wall. That is an incredibly close surveillance system. And it must almost certainly be about making sure you had people in the right positions to stop them from sneaking over the wall yeah. unobserved. So if you like, it's an early warning system. Yeah. The number of soldiers based in a mile castle would have been very, very small indeed. Maybe only eight in that small barrack block over there. But it looks as though there was a major change of plan during the construction process. As Hadrian's Wall was being built, the plan evolved as well as those small mile castles, the Roman army also began to build a series of huge, heavily defended forts into the line of the wall itself. So these are serious military bases holding hundreds of people, a far cry from the eight or so, the handful of people you'd find in here. Perhaps the most famous and dramatic of all of these forts is Housesteads. And crucially, the Romans filled forts like this, not just with ordinary foot soldiers, but with cavalrymen. Perhaps that was a reaction to the ferocity of the native Britons to the north, or just a bureaucratic decision from on high. Whatever the reason, from this point on, these forts and their cavalry became key to defending Hadrian's Wall. When you think about the frontier, we mustn't just think about this line. It's a crucial part of it, but there's a much wider frontier zone. And by having concentrated forces, and in particular by having cavalry, you have that strike force to the north and indeed to the south, should you need it. So it's about really enhancing that capability. So it's about controlling a zone rather than exactly. just having this line. Yeah, yeah, the Romans wanted it all. They're controlling a line and they're controlling zones to either side. Yeah. Just looking at this landscape, you can see why the Romans decided to move their cavalry onto Hadrian's Wall. Fast horsemen could move quickly to cut off the first signs of trouble from the native Britons. Not far from here is another of these huge forts built into Hadrian's Wall. This one was built at a strategic crossing of the River Tyne, at a place now called Chester's. In its heyday, it was home to 500 cavalrymen and their horses. New discoveries here are helping to reveal why the Roman cavalry was such an effective fighting force. 
To discover more, I'm meeting Kevin Booth of English Heritage. One of the most recognisable parts of the fort is its living quarters, or barracks. Barrack blocks are similar right across the Roman Empire, but there was always a mystery at cavalry bases. There was plenty of accommodation for the soldiers, but where were the stables? The answer emerged in the late 1990s, when archaeologists in Newcastle made a remarkable discovery. During excavations of a similar barrack block, they found a series of shallow pits, and it was realised that these were rudimentary drains for horses' urine. So the men and the horses were in fact living in the same buildings. In each of these spaces, you've got three men and three horses living side by side. So there would have been three men and three horses in just this space? It does seem quite extraordinary, and with a relatively narrow doorway. In fact, we have stood pretty much on the line of the, of the petition between the front half with the horses and the men at the back. It would have been pretty dank and smelly in here, I imagine. To our sensibilities, no doubt. Yeah. yeah. But I, I don't know, I suppose you get used to it, don't you? It seems like a peculiar setup. I mean, why, why wouldn't they have stables elsewhere? Why, why are they kind of forcing the men and the horses in together? It's intimate, and yeah. perhaps that's the point. You're maintaining that strong bond between the man and his horse, and that is also to do with finance. You know, the horse uh, essentially is paid for out of the Roman soldier's wages. He has a financial investment in it. And I think also if you've got a, a fort that has 500 horses in it, hygiene and, and good maintenance is all. And then also, if you need to get out of the north gate of this fort at speed, you're ready, you're prepared, you're away. So you're on call here in the barracks, ready to jump on your horse and set off at any time? Absolutely, permanently. These men must have had a uniquely close relationship with their horses, which it's hard for us to understand. They lived side by side and fought together. To try to understand how the Roman cavalry rode and fought on horseback, I'm meeting the leader of the modern riding troop, Alan Larson. Who's this? This is Finbar and Finbar has the distinction in the Terma show of being the mount of the Emperor Hadrian. Oh, really? And he's got the most magnificent set of recreated second century saddlery on Alice. Hello, Finbar. And an amazing saddle. I mean, this saddle looks completely different from modern saddles. Although it's not the most comfortable of saddles, it, it does the job brilliantly. And so how do you know what Roman saddles would have been like? We owe a great debt to um, a wonderful man called Dr. Peter Connolly, who reconstructed uh, the, the Roman saddles from the, the cover, the outer leather cover, which was found preserved in a bog uh, during a dig at a yeah. Roman cavalry camp. He had the genius moment of realising that if you, if you put a frame inside it, it yeah. could function perfectly well. And I noticed that Finbar hasn't got any stirrups. No. So is that normal for mm. Roman Roman, Roman cavalry saddles do not have stirrups. Um, they didn't need them, essentially. They were so well wedged into the saddle with these four horns that they were able to, to do everything that, that a, a modern rider can do. And what about the horses themselves, Alan? What, what would they have been like? Were they very different to modern horses? Yeah, the Roman cavalry horses were, were small by our standards. Finbar is 15 hands, and that's as big as Roman cavalry horses got. So were they choosing to have small horses, or was that just all that was available? No, that was all that was available. The majority of them are what we'd call ponies. But the good news about that is that a sure-footed, sturdy little pony can carry you for miles and miles, days and days, up and down hills in country that a bigger, more finely bred horse would begin to falter. On these small, rugged horses, a cavalryman could travel 40 miles in a day. Selecting the right horses is also going to be crucial for the 30 modern reenactors who are taking on the huge challenge of staging a Roman cavalry tournament. 
A month before the big show, troop leader Alan Larson is bringing together six key riders and their horses for a vital first training session. In the Roman age, cavalry tournaments were designed to showcase the horsemen's skills in a public arena. These six riders are taking on the role of the elite who starred in the highlight of the tournament, a competition of horsemanship fought between two teams. It's undoubtedly one of the most challenging of equestrian and reenactment disciplines. And a relatively few number of, of riders have the skills and determination to, to see it through. Historians have pieced together what they know about Roman cavalry tournaments from the ancient literature. But this project will allow them to examine the cavalry's equipment in action, as well as to better understand the tactics and manoeuvres they've only ever read about. At today's session, the team needs to practise three of these manoeuvres, which they'll eventually be performing at the show. Before they begin, Nigel, the lead rider, calls the team together for a briefing to discuss the first task, the so-called Cantabrian Wheel. OK, everybody. Everybody happy with their horses? Right, what we're going to do first, while we're in modern clothing and modern tack, is start putting together the basis of that Cantabrian Wheel. OK, so in that, Magyar and Shadow will be the target horses and you four will be riding around pelting our shields with your javelins. The Cantabrian Wheel was a classic Roman battle tactic which was practised as part of the cavalry tournament. On the battlefield, it was designed to harass enemy forces, but in the tournament, the cavalrymen scored points by hitting their opponents with blunted javelins. Good hit. Bad shot. We're putting the horses and the riders through their paces. They're uh, concentrating on the business of hurling javelins at each other in a competition, which uh, will be as much of a spectacle now as it was in the early 2nd century AD. Nice, Mark. Nice. I didn't actually mean to hit your camera then. The modern riders are discovering firsthand that Roman cavalry tournaments were probably also a key part of training soldiers for war. With one exercise under their belts, they'll now attempt two other disciplines from the Roman cavalry tournament. The pursuit, in which one rider attacks and then flees defending their back with their shield. And the charge, which is like a medieval joust, where two riders meet in a clash of javelins at speed. But during the charge, the team gets a taste of just how tough Roman cavalry riding can be. Guys, this is off. This is off. OK. Lucy is winded by the fall but nothing is broken. I'm feeling OK, bruised, but I'll be fine. So you're going to get back in the saddle? I'm going to get back in the saddle, yep. That's what we do, we fall off, we get back in the saddle. The riders are relying heavily on their recreated Roman saddles, and Lucy's accident has highlighted that they're testing these things to their limits, and they'll need to improve them. So this is the point at which the saddle uh, is attached, the girth is where we put the tie, tie the girth on, and there isn't one on this side. It is here. <laughs> so that's what happened. That should be there. It just ripped under the pressure. So this is going to need a good repair before we actually get to the event. The elite riders won't practise again as a group until they meet in Carlisle for the event, when they'll have to work with 24 other riders as a complete Roman troop. There's still a long way to go before they can stage a successful tournament. Every piece of equipment you put on makes it more difficult. Um, the visibility was a bit of a problem at times. It is tiring, very, very tiring. 
I'm very, very tired. <laughs> From ancient records, we know that there would have been around 10,000 cavalrymen in Britain at any one time. But not all of them were stationed on Hadrian's Wall. There was in fact a network of cavalry forts located across the north, all designed to help Romans control the local population. One of the most important cavalry bases in northern Britain was built at Ribchester near modern Preston in 70 AD. And currently, archaeologists are uncovering new clues about who those cavalrymen actually were. Since 2015, a team from the University of Central Lancashire has been running this new dig at Ribchester. Much of the fort now lies under the modern village, so the team has opened a trench in a back garden. They've revealed a number of the cavalry fort's buildings and are beginning to understand the fort's layout. But they're also starting to find small clues that can tell them more about where the men who lived here came from. DIG co-director Duncan Sayer is examining an intriguing piece of pottery the team has found. Under this bucket, we have a vaulting tube. This would have been a much larger object that comes around out here somewhere. It has a tube on one end, and then it has a socket on the other. And you can see on this here, it just has a slightly more of a curve on this side than it does on this side. So when you put lots and lots and lots and lots of those together, then it creates an arch. What's quite nice about this is these things are seen only in North Africa and at Chester's Roman fort. Uh, and that's really interesting because the Spanish cavalry came here first and then they moved on to Chester's. And so somewhere there would be these gently domed buildings, which is, I think, quite nice. And we would have looked really quite exotic and even out of place in rural Lancashire. This fort was first manned by a Spanish cavalry regiment who must have brought this exotic architecture with them. Cavalrymen were recruited from conquered tribes across the Roman Empire, from places like France, Spain, the Netherlands, Eastern Europe, Syria and North Africa. But as well as finding clues about who these men were, the team is also finding incredible personal artefacts that give us a glimpse into daily life here. While they take a break, Duncan Sayer is meeting fine specialist Justine Biddle, to examine some of the most recently discovered objects. What is this, Justine? So this is um, what's known as a terret ring that would be part of our horse's bridle fitting. OK, so where so would that fit around the It would go the um, on the cheek. That's all there? Yeah, <laughs> exactly okay, there. Okay. And you'd have one, one part of the reins would be going, or one part of the harness would be going back towards the head and holding the, the harness in position. That's really interesting, so it really gives us yeah. that, that evidence of, of, of ridden horses. No, no, absolutely. In Ribchester, which is yeah. what you'd expect, isn't it? Yeah, no, it's exactly. Great. And then one of the best pieces of dating evidence on a Roman site is just that you expect to find loads of coins, especially in military sites. It's a silver denarius of the Emperor Vespasian. There he is. Um, it's got a dolphin and an anchor on the reverse side of it. And that was minted between 79 and 89 AD probably comes over and is lost in the, from the pocket or from the, the pouch of a Roman yeah. cavalry soldier. Yeah, almost certainly. He'd have been a bit annoyed about losing that. He would have been really cross about losing that. That's quite a lot of money that's just fallen into the ditch. But it's not only digs that can reveal new information about who the cavalrymen were, and sometimes these clues can be found in the most unexpected places. This is Hexham Abbey. The original church here was one of the oldest in Britain, but I'm after something even more ancient, and that's one of the most striking traces that we have of the Roman cavalry. When the original Saxon church was built here at Hexham, much of the stone used was robbed from nearby Roman buildings. During renovation work in the 19th century, workers discovered a huge flagstone in the floor. When it was lifted, it turned out to be a Roman cavalry tombstone. 
To find out more about it, I'm meeting Lindsay Allison Jones of Newcastle University. Lindsay, this is a magnificent tombstone. It's absolutely huge. Who is this we're looking at? Well, this is a man called Flavinus, who was a standard bearer in the cavalry regiment of Petriana. Um, and you can see he's holding the standard there. So he was presumably very well known. He was high status to have something like this as his grave marker. This has been an extremely expensive gravestone. It's got an enormous amount of decoration and, and detail. And you can see all the detail of the horse, you can see the horse's mane, mm. you can see all the reins and the trappings here. All those, all those horse trappings that we find archaeologically and yes. you know, here they are. There they are, displayed. yes. Yes, indeed, yeah. yeah. Tombstones like this have been invaluable in revealing what a cavalryman looked like. They show us how things like the horse tack and the weapons were actually worn. But this tombstone can also reveal more about this particular man's identity and how cavalrymen wanted to be remembered. He's shown in heroic pose, galloping away, mm. but poor old barbarian he's slain is not in heroic pose. He's being booted up the backside, but he's still hanging on to his sword mm. and fighting back to the end. But being trampled underfoot. Absolutely, yeah. yes. Yeah. So what do we know about this man, other than that he's obviously in the cavalry? Well, the inscription at the bottom tells us his name is Flavinus, but he's only got the one name, which suggests mm. he's not a Roman citizen. It's possible that he came from Gaul or from Spain. And it's interesting that he's, you know, he's shown trampling a barbarian, but if, as you say, you know, he may have been a Celt, he may have been a Gaul, then you know, his, his family would have been barbarians just a couple of generations yes. back. Yes, well, one man's barbarian is another man's neighbour. Um, but this is, this is a, um, an artistic trope. This is the way cavalrymen like to be shown. Wherever they came from, once these men were part of the Roman army, they seem to have embraced their new roles wholeheartedly. The impression this tombstone gives is that he may have been from a noble family. Mm. And if you were a young man with um, heroic bent who was keen on horses, then becoming a cavalryman in the Roman army was the best way to really mm. live your life in the way you wanted to. There is an element of, you, uh, of um, if you can't beat them, join them, isn't there? Oh, yes, yes, I think so, yes. Yeah. yes. And, of course, he would have been very well paid as well, yeah. <laughs> able to afford all this bling. The cavalrymen were the elite of the Roman army, and this status drew young men from across the Roman Empire, even from conquered peoples, into their ranks. And now, having seen cavalry kit depicted on a tombstone and pieces recovered archaeologically, I want to see what they looked like on the men and their horses in the flesh. And to do that, I'm joining Nigel, who will be leading the elite riders in the show, and who's also an amateur historian of cavalry. Nigel, you've got some of the kits ready here. Talk me through it. Uh, well, let's start with the, uh, the first piece of protection. The important thing is the mail. And like most things Roman, it's not Roman. So it's been adopted from the Gallic tribes. Can I see how heavy that is? Oh, okay. yeah. I haven't weighed it, but I think it's around 11, 12 kilos. It must be at least that. God, that's a huge weight to be carrying around before you start to load up with all the weapons themselves. Absolutely, yeah. But I mean, once it's on, once it's on your body and a load is spread, you don't yeah. notice it as much. Yeah. OK, so you're wearing 12 kilos worth of chain mail and then you're carrying a shield as well. So that's, yeah, that looks which pretty heavy. Which is quite heavy. A bit of that. Yeah. So you wear that. Oh, how well, do you wear that? Well, we, we are using these two straps. These are not correct. Yeah. Okay, no evidence for strapping like that, but because we're using modern horses and riding in a modern style, we've got to compromise. Yeah. Our best guess from all of the evidence is that actually they are holding the shield in a centre grip. Oh, right. With yeah. the reins in the same hand. Oh. Part of the problem you're getting as well is that weight means that you are always unbalanced on the horse. And what we're starting to find after a couple of days is that we're all getting a lot of pressure on the right side of our groin, and that's mm. because we're counterbalancing that weight by putting more pressure on the right side of the horse. Yeah. So we're tiring our right leg more than our left leg. What the elite Roman cavalry were most famous for was their masked helmets. Many of these remarkable objects have been discovered across Europe, and these finds have provided templates for Nigel and his team's modern recreations. 
but archaeologists have never been sure if these elaborate helmets were just for show or whether they could have been used in combat. Some of these helmets, like this sports helmet here, is a perfectly functioning cavalry helmet. Yeah. Um, the only thing that's different is the addition of the face mask. Now, if that face mask is made to fit the cavalryman's face, absolutely fine. Better visibility than the later medieval helmet, and the, the effect psychologically on an enemy would be tremendous. There's something quite scary about them, that expressionless face, I think. Yeah, yeah. but the idea yeah. that you know, it inhibits you so much that you know, they're impractical for use, well, well, we'll be demonstrating that's not the case. Can I try one? Absolutely. So do, do you put one of these on first? Yep. OK, let's try this one. OK, it should go straight on. Oh, yeah, it's quite a snug fit, actually. Yeah. Well, it needs to be. What, yeah. you, what you can't have is it moving, because that's when you'll be blind. Yeah. So it needs to be... You need to get used to the discomfort of having it firmly fixed over your face. I'm not even moving in here, Nigel. It's getting, it's getting a bit hot and sweaty already. Yeah. Just from my breathing. I'm going to take that off. Ugh. It's amazing to know so much detail, isn't it? A lot of this is kind of working out what works, you know, what kind of padding you need, uh, how it all fits together, how it all works together, and you can only really do that by trying it out. Yes, absolutely. I'm really looking forward to the term of this afternoon, but I've already started to learn a lot more about the Roman cavalry from talking to the archaeologists and about how important this experimental archaeology is when suddenly all of their research gets tested, gets put into practice. How does it feel and how does it work to put on all of that armour, all of that kit, get on a horse and ride out into battle? What made the elite Roman cavalry such feared warriors? wasn't just access to the best kit available, but a gruelling training regime. But the modern riders who are putting on the cavalry tournament have to cram their Roman cavalry training into just one session the day before the performance. For the first time, all 30 horses and riders are in one place. They need to gel as a unit and perfect a difficult manoeuvre that's a key part of the show. This is one of the most challenging things that I've done. Technically, it's hugely difficult bringing together this number of horses and riders for the first time to try and do justice to what was an elite military force. All riders, please! When we go out next, we're going to go out as we are. We're going to go out with shields and with spears. We're going to do some basic drill with the whole terma together. So we're going to make our way down we're going to come into the arena in files, a blue file and a red file. I'm then going to take us through some basic drill around the arena, which as you know is the basis of the show this afternoon. My primary concern has always got to be the horses and keeping them happy and, and healthy. You've also got to be aware of how hard you can push men to achieve the result. Morale is crucial. Based on ancient literature, it's thought that a terma, the Latin for troop, was made up of 30 horsemen. The key thing to perfect in the rehearsal is a wield, where the whole terma will ride around the arena in two ranks, at a trot and then at a canter. It's a complex and difficult manoeuvre to choreograph. you learn a lot about how they must have done it in Roman times. Because when you try this stuff yourself, you understand a whole set of just small practical details, but they add up. And that's something we think about training the men, the cavalry men, but in some ways they're much less important than ca uh, training the cavalry horses together. So you learn all sorts of things, as well as small details of tack and kit and so on. And a lot of the skills really must have taken years of practice to get perfected. <laughs> We're playing catch up. They had it, they were the masters, and we are playing catch-up. Both looking forward to it and a bit nervous about it. I think this is the most nervous I've been about a reenactment. I do so many of them each year, but this one seems to be a higher stakes, and we have more to prove or more that can go wrong.
I really feel I'm beginning to build up a picture of who these Roman cavalrymen were. I've seen how they rode, how they trained, and how they dressed. But I want to discover more about what their own experiences were like here on the fringes of the Roman Empire. And to do that, I'm visiting a place where you can almost disappear back into the Roman past. It's so fresh and visceral. It's called Vindolanda, and it's one of the most important archaeological sites in Britain. It was a Roman military fort, which was in use for centuries. In fact, there were nine different forts here, all built one on top of another. When digging began here in the 1970s, it was discovered that the deep levels were amazingly well preserved because they were waterlogged and contained very little oxygen. This lack of oxygen meant that organic objects which usually decay in the ground had been preserved. Things like wood, bone and leather survive in almost perfect condition at Vindolanda. It seems I've picked just about the worst day to visit this digging season. Torrential rain has meant that the excavations have been abandoned. But that doesn't matter, because I'm most interested in seeing some of the small finds that have emerged from this extraordinary site over the years. And to see what these finds from Vindolanda can tell us about the cavalry and their lives on the northern frontier, I'm on my way to the museum's stores to meet curator Barbara Burley. Barbara, it's always astonishing to see the preservation of things like leather at Vindolanda. What was this leather object? Well, we know by kind of looking at all of the different fragments that it's actually part of a horse's chamfron, is which is a ceremonial head mask that they wear. And if you start to look at this piece here, it's the kind of telltale shape of the horse's ear. And uh, is this possibly the edge of an eye hole there? Exactly, yeah. So that would be where the horse's eye would come through and you would have something like a, a decorated um, kind of eye guard. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it was highly decorated, beautiful, beautiful yeah. piece. This find and several others have allowed the team here to reconstruct a cavalry chamfron. The incredible preservation at Vindolanda also led to one of the most important archaeological discoveries of the 20th century. During one of the first digging seasons here, in 1973, the site director Robin Burley was working in one of the deep levels when he discovered small fragments of wood with writing on them. What he'd found were Roman writing tablets, letters, accounts and official documents from the fort. Once out of the ground, the writing began to disappear almost immediately, so they were sent to specialists who photographed them with infrared cameras, which revealed the vanished text. These documents have given us a unique insight into life on the northern frontier. But what's often overlooked is that many of them are written by or about the cavalrymen. In one famous letter, which seems to be an intelligence report for Vinderlander's cavalrymen, we learn about the enemy they had to face. The Britons are unprotected by armour. There are very many cavalry. The cavalry do not use swords, nor do the wretched Britons mount in order to throw javelins. After years of research, Barbara and her team are also starting to discover personal stories about individual cavalrymen from the Vindolanda letters. And you've got some reproductions here of a couple of the wonderful Vindolanda letters. Uh, yeah. What are these referring to? Well, the letters, um, the writing tablets, give us such a good idea of the actual people here. Both of these are accounts, and um, they talk about a single individual. His name is Tagamas, and he's from the Vardulian Cavalry, and his name is just across here. Um, it's difficult to make out, It isn't is it? very yeah. difficult. But the interesting thing about this particular letter is it says, Tagamas's companion. Mm. Now, if that was a man, you would just put his name. So the idea is that it was his common law wife, because at this period on the site, they weren't allowed to marry. 
This one here, um, again, talks about Tagamas, and he's right here, um, and he's a Vexillarius, which means that he is the standard bearer um, for the Varduli cavalry. Yeah. And here he's purchasing lances, uh, common cavalry equipment, so it's not hugely surprising. But his story goes further because not only do we have him in the tablets, but we also have him on this amphora handle. So you can just see T-A-G-O-M. A S Tagamas. Whatever was in here, and we think it was olive stewed in wine, he didn't trust his fellow officers because he had to write his name on his precious imported food. Yeah. So you start to build up these pictures that he was married, that he um, you know, he has his friends and what he's ordering and what he's doing, also that he likes his his food. Um, he's got enough money to import food that normally grow in Northumberland. So you're starting to really build up this lovely yeah. picture of who these people are. I've been trying to get a better picture of the Roman cavalry and it's here at Vindolanda that I feel that it's finally coming into focus, that we have this wonderful evidence, written evidence of precisely which troops were garrisoned here. But actually, we're homing right in and we have the name of this one man who we know is the standard bearer for his troop. For much of the Roman occupation, the cavalry at places like Vindolanda were here to suppress our ancient ancestors. But over the centuries of Roman rule, that relationship evolved and they began to put down roots. 30 miles south of Hadrian's Wall, at Binchester, County Durham, archaeologists are working at the site of another cavalry fort. And they're finding evidence that it wasn't just cavalrymen living here, but their families too. The team is from Durham University, and they're excavating the fort's cemetery, but they're facing an uphill struggle. The soil conditions mean that little survives in this ground. Leading the dig is Dr. David Petz. One of the troubles we've been fighting is the soil's really acid. So normally when you're looking for a cemetery, you would find bones that would tell you it's a grave. Instead, we just have things like this, six foot long pits, which most of the time contain virtually nothing in them. But by chance, in one corner of the trench, the team has found a skeleton that has survived the acid soil conditions it might be able to give the team some insights into the people who lived here. And we can see some of the bones survive, bits of a skull, bits of a jaw, lower jaw, you can see. What we will be able to do is get a lot of information from the teeth. And we can look at the chemistry uh, of those teeth and they tell us quite a lot of information. So they'll tell us about things like their diet, so a proportion of meat and vegetables which these people were eating. And that's quite interesting, because you know, we might expect the soldiers to have better diets than, than the civilians. There's also potential to tell us even broadly where these people came from. So is it someone who was born and brought up here, or is it someone who came from another part of Roman Britain or elsewhere in the Roman Empire? So by looking at the teeth, doing, doing stuff back in the lab, we can draw a remarkable amount of information, even from a quite a poorly preserved skeleton like this. These results will be another useful piece of the jigsaw puzzle to help archaeologists understand who was living at this fort in late Roman Britain. In another area of the site, one of the archaeologists has made a discovery which adds weight to the idea that the fort contained not only the soldiers, but their families. It's a child's grave. So we've now got two beads have come out of this, this little feature. Uh, but I think because we're getting this little group of beads, suggest it's a child's grave. Even though no bones have survived here, this pit is most likely to have been a grave, and these beads would have accompanied the child's body. What's clear here is we've got all parts of society, so it's not just the soldiers, but it's their children, because you've got children's graves, it's their, presumably their wives, because you've got adult graves with, with female jewellery. The, a fort like this, it's not just isolated soldiers in the middle of nowhere. They're the people who make the empire bigger and protect it, but they're marrying with the people who, generations ago, they actually conquered. And it's really lovely to think about how these populations work.
In Carlisle, the final preparations are being made for the big show. But having 30 riders all together is a unique opportunity for the archaeologists. And so they've decided to ask Alan and his riders to test out some of their theories about the cavalry that go beyond the tournament itself. They want to try to answer a key question about how the cavalry fought and discover if a certain battle formation they've read about in ancient literature can actually be performed in real life. I'm joining archaeologist and event organiser Bill Griffiths to see if Alan and his team can provide some answers. So what are the main research questions for you then? What would you really like to find out today? No one's done this before, put 30 riders in full kit in a field. Really? No, no one's done it. Well, the Romans did. Yeah, yeah. Not, not since. And with the proper authentic kit, with the stirrupless saddles, all these kinds of things. And we just want to see if we can learn some new data about how these cavalry rode, what it was like to ride in a unit, what it's like to ride in formation. Bill and the other archaeologists want to see how the Roman cavalry might have attacked their British enemies. There are some literary texts that describe Roman cavalry drill, but all we've got is the words. Yeah. So at the moment, we've been interpreting the words. Now, are we interpreting them right? Actually, once you have the horses with you, you can start to play about and say, well, actually, you can do this, you can't do that. Alan and his riders are going to attempt to create a battle formation called the Wedge. The archaeologists think this might have been used to attack enemy formations, sowing panic in their ranks. So we're now assembling the uh, the cuneo, the wedge. Great. Yeah, and we'll see how that goes. Fantastic. So is this a battle formation? This is a battle formation. I mean, there's a sometimes the cavalry describe the cuneus, which is the wedge. So it's really it's a just form a triangle to to break into the ranks of your enemy. The riders carefully form up in ranks to create a wedge shape. Wedge formation, this is the cuneo yeah. cantering. Yeah. And they're holding it together. That's amazing, Bill. Yeah. Just first time they're out and they've done it. Nailed it. That's so fantastic. It proves it's possible. Yeah. Oh my God! It's quite terrifying actually standing here as they're coming and, towards and us. We're at, we're at the side of it. Imagine that coming straight at you. Yeah. You yeah. know, that would be a terrifying sight. And you know, mm. your first instinct is gonna to be to run away. Mm. Alan and his team have managed to recreate something that hasn't been seen for over 1,600 years. And the academics have been able to prove that it was easily possible for the Roman cavalry to attack their enemies using the cuneus or wedge formation. But the cavalry weren't just the most feared soldiers in the Roman army. From ancient literature, we also know they were the best paid outstripping even the citizen soldiers of the legions. To see for myself what their huge pay packets were spent on, I'm back at Chester's Roman fort on Hadrian's Wall. I'm meeting Francis Mackintosh of English Heritage, who's been re-examining the archaeological collection at Chester's, which was dug up in the Victorian era. The objects in the museum here really highlight just how wealthy and powerful the Roman cavalry were in Britain. So these objects were excavated more than a century ago? That's right. So John Clayton inherited the big mansion house at Chester's in the 1830s, and he had Chester's Roman fort in his front garden. So he excavated there nearly every year until he died in 1890. So we've got all of these fantastic objects from those excavations, but you've been taking another look at them, haven't you? Scholarships changed a huge amount in that amount of time. We've learned a lot, there's been a lot more finds which give us different information. So mm. one of the things related to the cavalry that we were able to discover is that these beads here that have always been presumed to be kind of jewellery, we now know from finds they've been strung on harness. So you have made new discoveries by revisiting yes. these old finds. Exactly, yeah. so even though I wasn't excavating, you know, I was kind of excavating the boxes and finding out yeah. new things, it's yeah. been really exciting. And these things look as though they would hang down off the horse. That's right, so these are some of the pendants that we have. This one's a really nice example because it has the hook 
pretty much complete. And if you see the design there is two dolphins. Oh yeah, so that would have been very bright and golden hanging down off the harness and jingling. Yeah, and glittering, catching the sun, makes the horsemen look very impressive and sound very impressive when they're advancing. Now this is a beautiful thing, what's that? It is. So this is a decorative element, it's a, a stud. You need to see it close up to get the real idea of the amazing decoration. It's absolutely gorgeous. It would have been mounted on harness. And imagine the metal is bright and um, shiny and it's got this milfiore enamel. So this is glass. That's right. So it's embedded those in it. rods that are twisted together to make the pattern then stretched and stretched until it's tiny and then you salami slice it and set it in. Isn't that wonderful? It's absolutely gorgeous. And the other Romans and other people in Britain would appreciate how expensive that was and the work that had gone into that. So it's all about the image and mm. projecting the fact that you're a cavalryman, you're paid more, you can afford to decorate your horse. Oh, they'd looked amazing, wouldn't they? Yeah. It is the afternoon of the big show in Carlisle. All the training and practice the modern riders have put in is going to be put to the test in front of a paying audience. And for the archaeologists, it's a unique opportunity to see their theories and assumptions put to the test. Events like this are always useful because however much theorising you do about things, once you actually see what can be done with a horse, and a rider, you have a much better idea of what the ancient texts are saying. I think that's so much more valuable. Backstage, the riders are readying the horses and checking and rechecking their kit. As the audience begins to stream into the arena, I'm going behind the scenes to see the final preparations for myself. How's it going, Nigel? <laughs> You're nearly ready. Yeah. It's been really hard road. I think it surprised us all, uh, you know, just, just how tough it was going to be. Yeah. Hasn't stopped yet, though? No. So, so we're uh, minutes away, aren't we? Yes, okay. I believe so. Well, yeah. I've lost all track of time, to be honest. <laughs> so, I'm just waiting for the order. There's a, an incredible sense of excitement just bubbling under the surface here and the riders are just about to set off into the arena. I'm going to go in and take my seat. I cannot wait. I'm going to be watching the action unfold in the company of Bill Griffiths, who, along with the other experts here, has spent years waiting for this moment. In Roman times, these events were competitions where riders battled it out for glory and reward in front of the emperor and the crowd. And to recreate some of that atmosphere today, the crowd has been split into two teams, red and blue. You're, you're on the red side, I'm on the blue side. Yeah, you're wearing a blue top yeah, as well, yeah, 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 I got red, yes. Yeah. Hey! That's my team. No, no, definitely not. Oh, that's, that's one for me, I think. We're already on the cheers. <laughs> The first part of the show sees the legionaries of the Ermine Street Guard strutting their stuff. Then it's time for Alan, Nigel and all 30 riders to take centre stage. So they're walking the troop round the arena at the moment. Yeah. What are they going to be doing? Well, you're going to see them start to form the Cantabrian circles and then bring out the, the best of the troops to demonstrate their prowess and skill at arms in front of their emperor competing for his favour. Nigel and the other elite riders take their positions for the first part of the competition. Three are carrying red shields, and three are carrying blue shields. They'll try to score points for their team by hitting their opponent's shields with blunted javelins. We should have a, um, we should put a bet on this. <laughs> <laughs> are you willing to bet uh, two denarii? Go, the first test is the Cantabrian the wheel. Yes. Oh, 
All the training and hard work has paid off, and even wearing those restrictive face masks, the team manages to hit their targets at speed. Three to me. Next is the charge, which is like a medieval joust, but with thrown javelins. The red team. Red point. Red team. Three points. Oh, it's close. And finally, the pursuit. One rider attacks and then is chased down by the victim. And as a final send-off to the crowd, the full troop of 30 Roman cavalry riders gallops past in unison. It's an awe-inspiring sight and a reminder that these tournaments were used to demonstrate Roman power to our ancient ancestors. What have you learned from this weekend? Just huge amounts. I mean, uh, one, just actually how relatively easy some of the drill is that we thought wasn't. Yeah. Um, how yeah. quickly riders can pick up some of that drill. How important this training, this spectacle is for the training of the army. There was a lot of debate. Is it just a show for the emperor? But you can see by going through it, it's really about developing the horsemanship of the soldiers for battle, mm. for contact with the enemy. And also, it does give you that real sense, doesn't it, of that imperial power and might and majesty projecting yeah. the power yeah. of imperial Rome. So there's a lot of people sticking around after the show itself and learning more about the Roman era and what a fantastic way to engage a wide audience with this period in our history and, and the archaeologists themselves have learned a lot from this experience. For me I found it impressive but I also found it quite intimidating there was that power of the Roman army brought to life, but it's a symbol of oppression as well. It's a really interesting double-edged sword, I think. For the reenactors, archaeologists and audience alike, this has been a unique opportunity to relive something that no one's seen for over 1,600 years. This restaging of a Roman tournament has been a magnificent spectacle, but actually it's more than that. It's about research as well, because it's allowed the archaeologists to test out some of their ideas. And informing everything that's been achieved by this project has been the tireless work of historians and archaeologists at digs, museums and in the archives. Each new clue they've unearthed has helped bring the Roman cavalry back to life and returned them to their rightful place at the centre of the story of Roman Britain. But it's a process that's not over yet. Across Hadrian's Wall and beyond, new discoveries will continue to build our knowledge of these forgotten horsemen.